Hmm. Hello, everybody. It's the time being 7 o'clock on this wonderful Monday, March 14th of 2022. I would like to call the Planning and Development Committee meeting to order. Can I please have a roll call? Silkaida? Here. Bella? Here. Daylight? Here. On guard? Here. Bancroft? Here. Lencioni? Yes. Trilla? Here. Werbaum? Here. Esner? Here. Weber? Present. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I would like a motion and second to approve the omnibus vote. If I could please have a motion. So moved. Second. Mo moved by Lencioni, seconded by Bancroft. Please, can I please have a roll call on that? Lakaida? Yes. Bella? Yes. Leitner? Yes. Ongard? Yes. Bancroft? Yes. Lencioni? Yes. Trilla? Yes. Werbaum? Yes. Bessner? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. First up, we have item 4A, which is going to be presented by Ellen Johnson regarding the 2022 inclusionary housing fee. Go ahead, Ellen. Oh. Well, it's part of omnibus. Oh, that, I'm sorry. Item yeah. 4B yeah. would be the presentation <laughs> regarding the historic preservation initiatives. Sorry, Rachel. No, no worries. Well, mm. Strive to be Ellen, so yeah. Compliment. Um, yeah, so uh, last October, the committee directed staff to look at the facade grant program, um, but I figured since we have some new committee members, it would be good to kind of just give a brief history of the Historic Commission before kind of diving into that um, recommendation. So the Historic Preservation Ordinance purpose is to foster awareness of history and encourage preservation, restoration, and rehabilitation. The commission has seven members on it. Um, they're appointed by the mayor and they have backgrounds in uh, architecture and, and history and stuff like that. They're all either business owners or residents of the city. And then the COAs is their tool used by the commission to review the proposed projects. Um, and again, the commission's primary responsibility is to review the building permits through the COA and either approve or deny it. Um, and then specifically our, our focus tonight, the facade grant program um, supports the incentive, the incentives preservation initiatives. So if there's a bigger project that the COA comes for them, um, there's the opportunity to fund. So our historic districts and landmarks, um, the central historic district was created in 1995. Um, that's kind of the main historic district of downtown, what many people think of as the historic district. And then the Moody Millington district was created in 2006. It's kind of this corner in the bottom right here. Um, it's 17 total properties. And then the Millington district was created in 2017. It's an eight block area, 51 properties. Then for the landmarks, some of them are on this map. There's 60 local landmarks, which is uh, kind of unusual for a lot of areas in the King County. Um, you know, our historic commission is very good at, at going out and looking at potential properties that could be landmarks and, and working with those owners to landmark those properties. And nine of those landmarks are also national landmarks. So the Potomotomy survey is a potential um, district that we're, we're looking into. It's in this red area up here, north of the central district by the Potawatomi neighborhood in the park. In 2019, the commission, historic commission guided a city council tour and then the council supported conducting an architectural survey of the area. After that tour, um, in 2021, we received a uh, state grant to hire a third party firm to conduct the survey. So MAA Architects out of Chicago is currently underway with that survey. Um, they're, they went out and took pictures and now they're in the research phase. Um, so that's underway, hopefully completed at, by the end of the year. This survey is um, comprised of 83 properties and after the survey is finished, the Historic Commission will review the results and provide a recommendation uh, on whether a historic district is appropriate for the area. Um, so that'll be exciting work for the end of the year. Um, statistically, just kind of looking at the last three years of the Historic Commission, you'll see that they review a lot of COA approvals. Um, that includes anything that includes uh, art, exterior building permits um, need to get a COA approval in the Historic District. And out of all of these COAs in the past three years, there's only been one denial. Um, so the Historic Commission is really good at working with the applicant to kind of curtail the plans to fit both parties' needs. In the facade grant, um, the residential 
we've seen some use, um, but definitely the commercial area is where we've seen people utilize that facade grant for, for work. Um, and then again, the landmarks have been pretty consistent, a little slow down with the pandemic, um, but still, still good numbers. So then moving on to the facade grant overview. Um, the facade grant was created in 1994 to assist the core of downtown with facade rehabilitation projects. So most of the buildings in the downtown area, specifically Main Street, um, have received this grant at one point in time to update this exterior of the facades, kind of bringing it back to the, same, the traditional look of downtown St. Charles. In 2007, the grant was expanded to allow all commercial properties within the historic district to be eligible for the grant, up to that $20,000 that it, it currently is. And then in 2017, um, the grant was expanded again to include residential properties, um, and they're only eligible for $5,000. So we go back to kind of present day, 2021, the PUD committee directed staff to consider changing eligibility requirements based on building age. Um, if you remember, I think it was 11 North 3rd Street and their siding, um, they had final siding and they were replacing it and half of it was used. Um, the grant was half used for half of their building and then they were getting insurance for the other half and it was more of a maintenance um, issue. And so we decided to take a look at um, those guidelines. So here are some of the past projects, uh, 2019, even on the river, this uh, exterior patio, and then in, um, 11 East Main Street, the windows, you notice they're a little higher, so they look a little more uniform and fit the building better. And then probably one that's really noticeable is, is this building um, kind of got a complete makeover with, with painting and, and the mural. And then this one also got um, a new, new painting and they reconstructed the chimney. And then again, a new storefront in 2021 um, for the 2B Beauty Company. So we looked at some potential options to amend the, the facade grant program based on your direction. Um, the first option was that all properties would be eligible, but preference were given to 50 plus years of age. Um, this was kind of a more relaxed option, and as we get further, it, was, it got more uh, scrutinous. So $40,000 eligible for all properties, and then again, the max amount of per was 20000 per property. Option two was that you had to, the building had to be 30 plus years of age. So right now, any building is, uh, is eligible in the historic district, but this would have limited to either 50 plus or 30 plus. Um, 30,000 for properties 50 plus years of age, and then 10,000 for properties 30 plus years of age would have been uh, the money allocated out of the budget. And then the max property amount would, be, would have been 15,000 for properties that were 50 plus years of age, and then 5,000 for properties 30 plus years of age. And then option three, which would have been, a, you know, the most scrutinous would have been, it would have had to be at least 50 years old, um, and then the full budget would have went for that for that 50 years of age and the max property amount, 20,000. So the historic commission's proposal is kind of a, a combination of all of those elements. Um, they decided to make the following changes that are outlined uh, in the facade grant program, but essentially that. They would like to see all properties eligible, but properties 50 plus years of age are given first priority until September 1st of the program year. Um, and then they wanted to focus on restoration projects over renovation projects. So some of those maintenance projects that we've seen in the past, um, well, maintenance wouldn't be eligible for, for these funds, but some of the other more um, restoration projects would be funded over renovation projects. Um, and then material replacements and building upgrades must restore or preserve the historic features or character of the building. So that would eliminate some of these changes in um, materials that, yes, they're better materials, but they're not necessarily going to restore um, the building. And then no building additions would be eligible for funds unless the work was tied to the rear entrance improvement. So there's a separate um, kind of caveat in the program guidelines that if you have a rear entrance, you're eligible for $10,000. So any building addition would have had to be in correlation with, with a rear entrance instead of just a, a building elevation. And then they also would like to see a 50% reimbursement up to $5,000 for architectural services. Um, and that change, we usually don't have people applying for the arch including architectural services in their bids just because most of the projects are larger scale that um, 
they kind of meet the threshold without needing that architectural services. Um, so with that, I have <clears throat> the chair of the Historic Commission is here. Um, if you want to ask her any questions, other than that, I will turn it over to you. If you like approve of these changes, we can move forward with an ordinance, or if you have any other questions. Yeah. I had a question about the, the, the rear entrance improvement. I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't understand the, the, the value of that change. Help, help me understand that better. Sure. So the rear entrance improve, um, improvement, the rear entrance is there's, so businesses are eligible for, for $20,000 max. You're eligible for $10,000 per facade, street facing facade, or um, $10,000 for a rear entrance, a rear public entrance. So it'd have to be a public entrance. Um, and so up to 20,000, so if you had a front entrance and a rear entrance and you, your rear entrance is public, you'd be eligible for that full 20,000. Now the building additions, um, take Eden on the river. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if there's a rear entrance, but in the thought process when that was approved was that people would be able to enter through the rear um, of that addition into the building, so that would qualify under the rear entrance program. So the, the inclusion of the um, addition only in, uh, with the rear entrance is that, you know, if somebody wanted to add on to their building in the back and make it blend in with the front of the building or the rest of the building, as long as it was a public rear entrance, they would be eligible for those funds. So they, um, before that, would they be eligible if that was not a public entrance? Or now they're eligible as long as it's a public entrance? As long as it's a public entrance, they can do an addition. So this change gets rid of funding any additions uh -huh. um, unless it was in Understood. accordance with it. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? Go ahead, Rita. Yeah, just clarification, mm -hmm. Rachel, either you or Kim. Um, <clears throat> in the slides where you said past projects 2020 and you had the two, it looks to me like they were paint jobs, but you're saying they were more than paint jobs? So they they were, well, this this one over here, they did some um, work with this iron work and with rebuilding, reconstructing the, okay. the chimneys, that okay. was some masonry work, okay. and then there was a paint job. And this one, yes, was, um, was a paint job. Um, the Historic Commission kind of looks at the extent of the paint job. So sometimes when you have to paint these old brick buildings, there's more work than just, you know, slapping on mm -hmm, some, mm -hmm. some paint. Um, and so I think that's where that would come in. Now, whether that would be a, a maintenance thing, yeah, um, I think would be under the session of the okay. Historic Commission, okay. Okay. Um, but it's definitely something that they'll look at at a case-by-case -case okay, basis, good. Thank determine you. if it's maintenance. And, and why September 1st? The thought with that was that we wanted to give priority to the older buildings, mm -hmm. um, and after September 1st is kind of well, obviously, the, the main construction and, and building projects are okay. usually done during the summer. So the thought was that people who wanted to ha do their projects during the prime construction season would okay. have their applications okay. in earlier in the year. So then by September 1st, some of the smaller projects that um, or projects that were bigger but not for older okay. buildings would be eligible good, by good. then. So rhyme or reason, that's good. It wasn't just... All right, thank you. And I, I love the restoration versus renovation. That's awesome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, David. Um, I was going to ask about September 1st as well, but just kind of expanding on that. So hypothetically, someone who has a 40-year-old building mm -hmm. is ready to go in February, um, and they come before the city and, and they're begging to, they need the funding now. Is there a mechanism to kind of put that aside, or they're, they're out of luck until September? Um, well, if we had funds left over in February, mm -hmm. they would apply. Typically, mm -hmm. I discourage people from applying that early, mm -hmm. um, usually like the month before, because otherwise I have to hold on to all these applications, and I don't want anything to get lost in the shuffle. Um, I think, you know, 40, it, I think it would depend um, mm -hmm. on the other applications that we were receiving. If we were, you know, if we weren't receiving as many as we thought, maybe we don't have to wait till that September 1st date. Um, but I think we would like to stick to that as, as much sure. as we can. And then also, basically, what we're at, and again, you're kind of asking us, we have three options. There's really four options, is what you're saying. There's the historic <laughs> preservation option. Yes. Okay. So. Go ahead, Ron. Um, thank you. Um, there's no maintenance. Who determines what's maintenance in that <clears throat> instance? There's nothing in there that says 
what is maintenance? I mean, everybody has a different opinion of what maintenance is, which is why we came up with this program through the last year's discussion. Yeah. Sure. So um, maintenance is, is usually something that doesn't require a building permit, um, but sometimes we'll have people come before us for grants for things that don't necessarily require uh, a building permit. So that would that type of work would definitely fall under the maintenance category. Um, and then I think, it, again, it would be on the discretion of the Historic Commission um, what qualifies a, as maintenance and, and what doesn't. But would it be advantageous then to put in there that if there's no permit, it definitely is not covered? You don't get the grant. I mean, something in there to say, you know, have some definition of maintenance versus sure. just a no no maintenance right. project allowed. Yeah, we can definitely add that. Thank you. Go ahead, Paul. Um, so, uh, how did you come up with the uh, the the concept of you know you have to let one third of the year pass before uh, the newer buildings? It like how much money is left? How was that? It, it Explain it so, because to me it's like, is that arbitrary or help me understand? Well, so Go ahead, Kim. You can step up to the oh, podium. Sorry. Kim Malay, Historic Preservation Chairman. Uh, chairperson. Um, to begin with, something to kind of keep in mind. 40 or 50 years now is, you know, 1970-something, okay? So most of those buildings, you know, we don't have a lot of that stock to begin with. But they are newer. They've probably been kept up to date a little bit better. Don't cost as much to maintain as some of these older buildings do. We have just about touched every downtown, especially along Main Street, building over the almost 30 years that we've been at this. So the thought was is that, again, you know, when we did the facade improvement program initially, it was really to beautify beautify, restore, and, you know, bring back those architectural details that we had covered up of over the years. So that was really part of what that whole program was about, and those are the buildings that do continue to cost some money and need to be kind of refreshed every once in a while. So that's kind of where that 50-plus came into play. Now, 50 wasn't just an arbitrary number either. The National Park Service, that's their uh, guideline for what is historic. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, so, so keep that in mind as yeah, well. But, Kim, but really, like, so, so you've got the four months because the plan year is from May 1st. So you've got four months to pass. And then, so why not four? Why is it four instead of six? How much money is generally left over in that? after the four months have expired, and how much of uh, an advantage does that give to 50-year-plus? So last year, for this for this current fiscal year, we ran out of money in the end of the first month. Yeah, first month. For, 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 commercial, for commercial buildings, we ran out of money. With, we had two applications and then a third one shortly after, so we were pretty much out of money. So the thought is that this would give time for you know, the buildings that need it the most to get it. Now, whether, you know, it's six months, three months, it's kind of so a, how it's many, how, it's how many How many years has the money lasted over? Mm. Over a month. Um, I, this, I've been here since 2018. Does this functionally preclude properties that are under 50 years old, old from, from being able to participate in this? I think it depends on the applications that we receive. So we're not always going to get... I'm looking, I'm looking at the history because I mean, sure. that's going to be a big part of, you know, so my I understanding. Tell, I can tell you, and I know the budget's been cut since, yeah. but I can tell you when we had a little bit bigger budget, I would sometimes go into December with okay. the still available. So, you know, it, that is something to kind of consider as well. Yeah, it, it just kind of depends on the projects that we receive. I think a lot of the, the buildings that we've seen in the past few years haven't necessarily hit that 50 plus years of age that, and have received the funds. So without those projects, because there's no guarantee that we're going to get projects that are 50 plus years of age. So anything, I mean, we could have a full $40,000 by, by September 1st. It just kind of depends. Um, and it, it's, it's hard to kind of estimate. I think there you're answering my question. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? <clears throat> no. Okay. Oh, go ahead, Brian. 
So the Historic Preservation Commission's uh, preference is option one, is that correct? Is that? Well, it's kind of a hybrid of all of it. All of it, it's kind of incorporated core. all of it, mm -hmm. okay. All right. Yeah, we thought that this would be a way to kind of still be able to help those buildings that aren't 50 sure. years, but still take precedence to the 50 years. Sure. Thank you. So uh, with that being said, um, is there a, uh, a motion on the floor to second to move one of these options or go with the historic preservation uh, recommendation? Go ahead, David. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, a better understanding, thank you for the information. I'll move to accept the historic preservation commission's uh, proposal. Thank you. Is yep. there a second. 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 Um, need a second, that. Um, with that being said, uh, let's uh, go ahead and have a oh, roll call I, and go with the chairman. Yes, go ahead, Ron. Would that include the language of some definition of maintenance? Or with, not? The, with the permit. So I would like to see some definition of maintenance in the final council approval, just so there's some definition of what is maintenance. I could permit, but then you got to put in at the discretion of yeah, the, the chairman, the commission. Too. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I'm just should, should I amend that, my? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll amend. I'll, I'll amend. I'll move to approve the proposal with uh, Ron's recommendations of uh, maintenance uh, mm -hmm. definition. Mm -hmm. so David was the original mover. Rita was the seconder. Do you approve? Second. Yep. Can I please have a roll call on that? Lakaida. Yes. Bala. Yes. Taylor. Yes. Bongar. Yes. Pancras. Yes. Mancioni. Yes. Trilla. Yes. Werbal. Yes. Fessner. Yes. Okay, thank you, motion carries. Moving along to item 4D, Russell is going to be giving us a presentation in regards to the city code being changed for outdoor cafes and food carts in public places. Go ahead, Russell. Yes, thank you. Uh, city code allows businesses in downtown to obtain permits to utilize both public sidewalks and plazas for outdoor cafes. Uh, in the First Street District, these permits are limited to two 100-day permits. And that spans from April 15th to October 31st. During the pandemic, a temporary outdoor dining program was created, which allowed for expanded utilization of both private and public outdoor spaces downtown. And this temporary program will end uh, on April 15th. So we're now looking ahead to regulations for the upcoming summer. The expanded use of the First Street plazas was successful generating business activity uh, and attention for the city's downtown district. Um, there's an interest from the businesses in continuing the expanded use of the plaza, and also there's a recognition that going forward it would be appropriate to require a fee for expanded use of the plaza as public space. So the proposal uh, for 2022 will leave the existing sidewalk cafe permit process in place um, as it's been um, before the pandemic, and that would apply to public sidewalks um, with some administrative updates. And we would second establish a separate fee uh, for use of the First Street plazas based on square footage. And the proposal is for 50 cents per square foot per 100-day period, and there's two 100-day periods in the summer season. And the square footages um, that are used to calculate the fee will be uh, based on the, the plaza configuration for each um, restaurant space. And we're proposing that the restaurants be allowed to use the same space that they uh, occupied last year, um, recognizing that the plaza will likely um, be under construction starting in 2023, and so once that project's completed, um, the areas will need to be uh, reallocated based on that uh, updated layout. Uh, so the, the resulting fees for 2022 um, would range from $400 to uh, $900 per business per 100-day period, or about $800 to $1,800 um, for the entire season. Um, and coming up with these fees, we looked at some other area communities um, that are continuing to have expanded outdoor dining in some form. They all use different calculations and methods to come up with their fees, um, but they're really based on the specifics of the location that they're making available. And really the First Street Plazas um, are a unique space. There isn't really a comparable um, uh, program that exists. Um, you know, it's not similar to a closed street or sidewalk. Um, so with that, um, we did reach out to the businesses. I was gonna turn it over to Derek Conley to comment on that. Thank you, Russell. Good evening. Uh, the administration did ask me to reach out to the five businesses that would be impacted by this new fee. Uh, so I did meet with them, explain the program, and specifically how much they would be uh, contributing to the fee uh, for 100 days. Uh, four out of five of the businesses, I would say, were very understanding and positive about the fee, including the amount. 
Uh, one of the businesses did express disappointment, uh, saying that uh, the business climate for restaurants was still uh, very poor right now. It has been for two years uh, and was still the case now, so they were disappointed. But overall, I would say it was uh, received positively from the five restaurants. Yes, with that, take any questions. Okay. Questions? Go ahead, Ed. So, Russ, why is there two 100-day periods? Is there non-interest in, in any of those restaurants not participating? So, it's a function of IRS regulations because the city used um, tax-exempt bonds to fund the improvements of the plaza. Um, there's limitations to the period of private use that can be granted. Um, so this program would be structured to comply with those guidelines, which limits it to no more than 100 days. But the expectation is all those participants will take advantage of both of those periods, I would assume. Yes, it's anticipated, because that covers the main summer season. Great, thank you. And the idea is that they could also do all four permits, essentially, and go year-round if they wanted, but most would just have that option of that summer dining season. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Go ahead, Rita. Yeah, um, I'm sticking to my guns as I was last year when we talked about this, saying, okay, when COVID's over, when everybody has 100% capacity, um, I want the public amenity back. I'm okay with um, uh, looking at your little chart that you had, Russ. The, yeah, sorry. You're talking about the layout? Yeah, the layout probably at the very end. There you go. Um, so say from the, uh, where you have the green public way, right there. I, I, I think the plaza needs to be more than a pass-through. Um, it's unique, it's, um, it's shaded, it's a great place for public um, on Wednesdays when uh, the downtown, uh, the Business Alliance had live music there. It was wonderful and it's shaded, whereas the other plaza isn't shaded, the other plaza is going to have some construction going on. I just really don't want to lose this amenity. So, but I would say that where you have the green sidewalk to the north, or pass whatever the pathway, that north is okay with me, which is what they kind of are doing anyway. And then maybe the same distance, I guess if you take the circles and say anything outside of the circles, um, you know, that, geez, I would like to appreciate the, the fountains. I would like to appreciate the benches. I would like to appreciate um, the music venue. I would, you know, but it's all of a sudden just the whole thing is taken over. And I, felt their pain. I was very, you know, compassionate. I understood when they were not allowed to be inside that this was a necessity. And then as we k gradually came out, you know, it's hard to pull that privilege, you know, but I said at the end of last year, I go, I want our public space back. Even though I think, wow, it was a great thing and um, a great amenity and it's costing a public amenity for the benefit of four businesses. And I don't think that's the other side of it, the fairness of it. No other business has that option, you know, to be alongside a, a beautiful, paved, lit, shaded um, area that the city is paid for and ma maintaining. So I would like to keep it fair and keep, um, that's just where, whether I'm the lone man on the totem pole, I don't know, but whatever, that's what I like. I want, that, want the plaza back for public use. Thank you. Brian, go ahead. Uh, just looking for some clarity. Under 12.04.102, um, outdoor cafes and food carts, uh, line number two, it says use of the first street east and west pop public plazas, 50 cents per square foot, public uh, plaza cafe area as determined by the city administrator. What does that mean? So we'll need to review these from an administrative standpoint when we're receiving the permits. So we have to look at the layout of the, the tables and the seating and make sure that they're meeting ADA requirements for the, the walkways and the access to the buildings. Um, but the intent would be for um, this overall layout um, to be presented to the, the council um, on a yearly basis if it changes. Um, this layout that we're proposing for this coming year is the same one we've had previous years because you know, we're looking at this sort of as a transition year, recognizing that it's gonna be sort of redesigned after the plaza expansion project is completed and um, rearranged. Um, and so at that point, you know, if we're in 2023 and there's an opportunity for 
the outdoor dining um, to be conducted in the, in the plaza, we'll be looking at a different layout. And so we'll, we'll be presenting that um, to the committee. So, Mike, what I'm looking for clarity on is, it says as determined, is that going to come back to council, city council, for approval? Do we need to put that language in there and, you know, for city council approval? Because yes. to me, I interpret it as the city administrator is going to make that decision. Yes, yeah, so you can clarify that in the code, that there's okay. a way out that okay. would be approved by the council. <clears throat> Any more comments? Go ahead, Ron. Thank you. Um, I agree with Rita. I've always talked about that, that it's still public property, and everybody should be able to go to another restaurant and bring something and eat it there without having to go into one of the other businesses' um, table area. Um, I think we should incorporate that, and I'm fine with the fees, too. I mean, it's public property. We can't get away for free. It wouldn't be, wouldn't be fair. So. Thank you, Ron. Go ahead, Paul. Um, I think this is a great compromise, and I think it's a, a, a real decent thing to do uh, for this year. But um, one of the things that I'm curious about in taking a look at it, because I think Rita does make some good points looking out in the future, is I'd like to see some information on for, for you know, with, because, uh, I mean, it's, it's awesome to eat out there, but it's a public amenity. If we're finding that outdoor dining, you know, works so well, like, I'd like to take a look at what should we do in the future? I mean, have we learned new things about this space? Should the building owners look at, you know, um, garage doors for the rest of it? But I'd, I'd like a plan. I'd like to make sure that we're looking now for guidance on, because I'm ex this is this is a this year plan. This isn't a forever plan, you know. And I know a lot of things are changing, but you know, I want really good information going forward because I I look at this and it, it seems reasonable for this year for sure. But I want so this just doesn't go on in perpetuity. Like I'd really like a good plan as we take a look at. I think it's cool that we've changed the way that people are using this St. Charles dining area, and it's a total boon to St. Charles. But I'd like guidance, like on what should we do because this can't continue like this forever. So, please, Heather. Absolutely. Uh, we, that was one of the discussion points we had today is we're sort of uh, hopefully moving out of COVID. One of the discussion items we had was what becomes the boundaries of the usable space for all of these businesses. So, because the plaza is not yet complete, we're still dealing with this year of uh, essentially unusable space for a large portion of it. So, the idea was to make a presentation to City Council to get, at least get a fee structure in place, and then once the plaza is complete and we have more usable space, that we now decide what the parameters and boundaries of that usable space for private businesses are, if they, we want them to be any. Uh, but at least for this year, because of the fact that outdoor dining has become so popular, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback mm -hmm. from both the businesses and the residents. COVID changed that, and I don't know that we're ever going to see it go back to a place where people don't want to see that space usable anymore, but uh, uh, certainly that's going to be up to City Council once we get through the construction of First Street Plaza to determine what we want to be usable. No, and, that, and that makes perfect sense, but I mean, even taking a look at it, if, it, if the outdoor space is that popular, I mean, some of the buildings should take a look at making some of their, you know, adjustments to the building to figure that out or, or just put something in place that's permanent so we're, we're not hitting the space after, after this period where we're like, okay, well, let's find the right way to use the space. So I, I really want to see, you know, creative Yep. creative ideas about like a middle ground because this isn't middle ground even though it's functional right now yep. i just don't want to get into a spot where this is over the next time you're like okay well i want i want that planning period to come walk all the way through this and get good guidance um because for the time being this makes sense but it won't later yeah Go ahead, Rita. yeah yeah to, to paul's point and i think that we talked about that um uh when the when we have our street just not a street anymore, and that's all a pedestrian way or whatever. It allows a couple of the businesses, um, uh, La Mesa, for instance, to use this area because mm -hmm. you know to construct it as such that it's flat. And I think Alter Brewery also made a request that they come come into the street too. Yeah, so I think what we're envisioning based on the the upcoming plan to modify the street is you will be able to move some of that dining that's currently on the plazas onto First Street. Um, so you're able to open up that central corridor through the this west plaza, which I think is, is so not in addition to <laughs> instead of yes yes okay. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, just to clarify, if a business doesn't want all of that square footage, they can just take whatever they're comfortable with. Is that correct? Yes, this okay. is just to allocate um, the space 
Okay, great. Thank you. Go ahead, David. No, I was just going to say, I mean, I agree with Paul and, and Rita's comments. Um, and that's true. I mean, we the future is unwritten, so we, you know, it'll look different in the future. So um, I understand Rita's, you know, original comments and, and uh, I don't want to use the word concerns, but thoughts that it, we might be um, opening a Pandora's box and it's going to stay that way. But um, yeah, and I think uh, the fee is fine too. It looks like we're the cheapest uh, compared to our peer community. So, um, so that's, that's that's good too. So I would support it. Go ahead, Todd. So just to remind me, when when this all came about a couple of years ago, didn't we? One of the things that we said we wanted to do was actually have a space planner come in, divide it up. I think we had a presentation on that at one point in time, which did show some stuff being pushed to the street as opposed to in the plaza. Where does that stand right now, sort of that analysis? So um, I think that was done sort of as um, an interim um, layout where we had looked at trying to relocate um, some of the areas to the street when the, knowing that the street was going to be closed. Uh, but that actual analysis of how it lays out with the, the project um, for the, the plaza expansion and the street reconstruction, so we have layouts um, for the proposed improvements there. And as part of the, the process um, for taking those plans um, before uh, plan commission and planning and development committee for approval, um, because it's a PUD, we will require that approval process, we'll be presenting options for areas that we think would make sense um, for that outdoor area based on the layout. Um, the actual design aspects of, you know, do we try and standardize some of the, the features and from an appearance standpoint, that will need to be developed, I think, once we have the spaces defined. So, so I, to me, that's, that's more critical than this now in a one-year plan and a fee structure. So I'd be supportive of this because I think it's, it's added a lot of, uh, you know, excitement to the downtown. It's been re very well received. Um, but I, I think we can't lose sight of that space plan and we can't lose sight of the standardization because, um, you know, this will quickly get out of control if people just take what they want and then pay on a per square foot basis. So, yeah. and I think it should be driven by us, not by mm -hmm. the business community there, mm -hmm. since mm -hmm. it is public space. So, again, I'd be supportive of it for right now for one year, but they should mm -hmm. all be admonished that it is one, you know, we're going to do it one more year. Um, this could change. We're still looking at all of this, and it's still all under review. Because I don't, I also don't want businesses making huge financial commitments, you know, thinking this is the way it's going to end up when it may not end up that way. Yeah. Go ahead. Ed. I want to jump on that because I, I do believe we talked about standardization of like what railings and fencing and yep. possibly even tables, and that was important to myself as well. So I know Alderman Bancroft did mention. Council person Bangkok has mentioned that as well. So hopefully we can let them know so they don't invest it. You're correct. Yeah, because I think part of the thought was continuing the same setup from last year would allow reuse of the mm -hmm. same materials that they had um, provided for the for their previous layouts. Yeah. Go ahead, Reggie. I'm uh, in agreement with this one more year and a fee structure, um, but I am worry that it's gotten out of hand you know we need to plan for down the road um and in just fairness to other businesses in town that own their private area mm -hmm. they invested in their land to host events like this mm -hmm. we can't forget about them also and some of them may feel like the city just now we're charging this year which is fine but sooner or later we have to have a plan down the road for how much square footage we're going to allocate of public land because people have paid for their private land at other restaurants in town. Yeah. Go ahead, Rita. Yeah, and I'm sure you're hearing from those that are paying taxes on that yes. land that this is a drop in the bucket for those that are paying tax on their land. Um, what about tents and all that, Russ? Please tell me no. Well, at this point, we're really only looking at the summer season. Okay. Um, so whether we would continue to allow um, any other types of structures, right now it isn't set up. Um, you know, that the tents were a function of this temporary program that we allowed tents. Okay, so there weren't tents there over the summer. I don't remember. I thought the No, I don't believe so. so. Okay. And they got the lights fixed that were cut down accidentally. Yeah, and the, the tents, you know, once we get out of this temporary program, the tents would be a function of our regular permitting um, approval process. Okay. So yes. if you have a tent, a privately placed tent, yes. there's a certain time period that could be up and it has to come down. Okay, good. Thank you. Go ahead, Ryan. Can you... 
Is there a way to summarize prior to COVID what activity was like in this space? Like what usage was like, what the foot traffic was, what the general, you know, I understand how, you know, the point we're at now, but is there any way to go back in time and take a snapshot of what that space was like, you know, for the couple hundred days that we're talking about now? In terms of the usage of the plaza or just by the businesses? Any, I mean, I, businesses are easy, but any way to get a, a snapshot of, of activity in that space, you know, back in 2018, 2019, you know, I know what COVID has looked like, but what we can anticipate if, if we hadn't done this. Because it really was kind of um, periodic planned events. So I know like the, um, the Business Alliance would have performances on the plaza. So it was sort of things that would happen maybe more on a weekly basis on the weekend um, to utilize the space. But, you know, typically during the week, it just remained as an open plaza. Wind down Wednesday. Steve. Can I make a comment? Yes, please. Okay. Um, I know that, you know, this is really hard to look at the plaza in its completion right now because it's obviously not done and we've gone through a lot with COVID. Um, a couple things I will say. Residents are very, very happy with the space. We are just talking about 2022 right now. So I think that Brian's question is valid to staff to start to look at what the impact was before and what the impact is with the changes. I also think, though, we do need to look at this holistically as the whole plaza is completed. And I think it's hard to visualize that right now since we're looking at these diagrams. But just remember, we are just looking at the coming year. There's a whole lot of other things we're going to have to talk about here as our first street gets completed with the design, as things open up and the street actually does close. So if you don't, just, I guess, Steve, to you, it's just if we could keep it focused on now. No, Thank absolutely. You. I mean, I, I think... Anybody else up there have any, any additional questions? I think everyone's pretty much spoke. Um, so obviously it sounds like, you know, we just want to have a go-forward plan after these initial 200 days, I guess, go. We want to make sure that um, uh, everyone's fine with the fees. Um, so with that being said, the way that it's currently written, I'd like a motion and a second to um, amend the city code. Uh, so move by. Sure. Could you add the language approved by council that could be added in or so I'll second that with sure. Then, sure. So we're going to amend the motion. Valencioni, do you approve the amending the motion? Help me, help me understand what we're... Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I don't accept the friendly amendment. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. So, so you made the original motion. Yeah. I'm looking for a second to approve the, the way that it's Ooh. currently um, written. Can I make a motion on it? Oh, you not. Okay. Okay. Right. Oh, this oh, is the wrong cannot. anniversary. You, yeah, you can rescind that. Yeah. <laughs> they weren't yeah. objecting the amendment. Yeah, yeah, no, no, right. yeah. Right. yeah. Right. So you make the motion. Yeah. Oh, okay, so, so Steve, I'm going to make the motion to approve this with the amendment to say approved by council on, on line number two. Line number two. I'm looking for a second. Second. So David Petrilla seconds that. Mm -hmm. um, with that, can I have a roll call? Bill Kaido? Yes. Bella? Yes. Hey, Leitner. Uh, I'm a no for the reasons I stated. Yep. Vanguard? Abstain. Bancroft? Yes. Lencioni? Abstain. Trilla? Yes. Cabal? Yes. Bessner? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you very much. Moving right along to item 4E, which will be presented by Ellen. Good evening. Um, 15 South 3rd Street, application for MAP amendment. Um, the subject property is located on the west side of downtown, across 3rd Street from Lazarus House. Lazarus House purchased the property in 2006 and has used the building for office space and as a day center, um, but the building has been vacant for the past two years. The property is zoned CBD2, mixed-use business district, um, and is located at the periphery of the CBD1 district. Lazarus House is requesting rezoning to CBD1. Um, they are planning to use the building as a two-unit apartment. Um, rezoning is necessary to allow the two-unit due to lot area requirement. Um, the parcel is 3,300 square feet in size, and the CBD2 district existing zoning requires a minimum lot area of 4,400 square feet for a two-family dwelling, uh, while only 2,000 square feet of lot area is needed in the CBD1 district. Um, 
Lazarus House plans to rehab the inside of the building, and the units will be rented at an affordable rate to Lazarus House clients who are transitioning um, out of the shelter and are transitioning to more permanent um, independent living. Um, Planning Commission held a public hearing on March 8th and recommended approval by unanimous vote, and we have um, a Lazarus House uh, board member here um, if there are any questions. Do we have any questions up here? I'll, I'll move for approval. Go ahead. David second. Moves it. Ryan Barngard seconds it. Can I please have a roll call? Brian Warburg. Brian Warburg. I did. Oh, you second. did? Oh, oh, did you? Okay. okay. Oh, okay. Roll Sorry. call, please. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. Paula? Yes. Hey, Leitner? Yes. Barngard? Yes. Bancroft? Yes. Sancioni? Yeah, I'm checking. Yes. Oh, it's not in the test. Patrilla? Yes. Werbaum? Yes. Bester? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you very much. Next one, we have item 4F. Go ahead, Rachel. In regards to the amendment of the Corporate Reserve of St. Charles PUD to allow a sign. Yes, thank you. Uh, Parvin Cross Sign Company has submitted a special use application requesting to amend the existing Corporate Reserve of St. Charles PUD to permit a development identification sign at the northwest corner of West Main Street and Cardinal Drive. Um, the new sign will be 105 square feet. It'll be not illuminated, um, and there will be three feet of landscape bed around it. The Planning Commission unanimous, unanimously approved um, the recommendation on March 8th um, with the following conditions that the sign setback shall be shown as 18 feet from the right of way. Um, the landscape plan be revised to accurately depict the length and width of the landscape bed and that half of the shrubs in the landscape bed must be either evergreen or deciduous. Um, the applicant did submit revised plans to meet those conditions and those were included in your packet. Um, that I can answer any questions. Any questions for council? Mm -hmm. Move for approval. Second cross approved. I move motion seconded by Ed. Please have a roll call. Okay, yes. Yes. Bala? Yes. Hey Leitner? Yes. Bongard? Yes. Bancroft? Yes. Lencioni? Yes. Trilla? Yes. Werbaum? Yes. Esner. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Item 4G, Russell Colby. Resolution for possible inducement of uh, inducement pheasant run tip district. Yes, uh, in November, the P&D committee recommended approval of development applications for the Pheasant Run Industrial Park. Uh, during the subsequent engineering review for the project, it was identified that the electric service demand uh, that was anticipated for the industrial users in the development would exceed the system capacity that's available at the site. And there'd be significant upgrades uh, necessary in order to extend electric service to the site um, from two city substations, and that cost has been estimated at $6 million. Uh, the developer, uh, Greco de Rosa, determined that this was an extraordinary cost um, that would prevent the project from proceeding without some financial assistance. Um, staff believe the tax increment financing TIF district would be advantageous uh, both for the industrial development uh, and the remaining resort property. Uh, staff's engaged our TIF consultant to prepare a report that documents the property's eligibility for a TIF district under state statute. Um, Greco de Rosa, the developer, has submitted a Part 1 incentive application, uh, which is under review. And consistent with the city's incentive policy, um, their proposal is a pay-as-you-go, um, where the developer would fund all improvements and be reimbursed only through tax increment generated by the project and no risk to the city. And the exact amount and schedule for that reimbursement uh, will be negotiated and presented at a future date um, as part of a redevelopment agreement. But the preliminary projections um, suggests that the TIF increment from the industrial development would be sufficient to reimburse the developer for the anticipated expenses that have been identified um, and generate significant additional increment um, that could contribute to funding other improvements within the TIF district, including um, redevelopment of the uh, resort buildings of the former Pheasant Run. So this inducement resolution that's being presented, um, the process to establish a TIF district um, takes five to six months. Um, in order to, for the developer to proceed further with the project, um, they're requesting the city approve an inducement resolution. Uh, this inducement resolution expresses the city's intent to establish a TIF district and negotiate a redevelopment agreement, um, which may provide for reimbursement um, of expenses uh, from TIF uh, revenues. So with this approval in place, the developer can, uh, at their own risk, 
proceed with incurring expenditures um, that could be reimbursed from TIF revenues. Uh, this resolution will also enable the zoning and subdivision approval to be granted um, so that the developer can proceed with the final engineering review. And so the inducement resolution is included in the packet. It's been reviewed by the city attorney. Thank you, Russell. Um, questions from council? Go ahead, David. So, <clears throat> um, Russ, so we, the, the committee pushed, you said November, correct, for the, and then the engineering um, study ha occurred since. But, you know, I, I'm just curious, like, the timing, because I, you know, I, I have this memo from you, the st uh, city staff back in June that seems yep. to be pretty robust, and the staff's, like, recommendations that there's, there not issues, but there's a lot to be done with the electric service. So why, I mean, I'm not necessarily opposed. I'm just curious, like, that's, that was pretty in your face. Why are we now talking about a TIF? Sure. So the, um, the comments that were provided, I think, are pretty typical of the level of detail that's provided in electric utility comments, uh, because as a municipal utility, uh, we have unique requirements that developers aren't that familiar with. So there typically are a lot of comments. Uh, because it was a concept plan level review, um, we had not received the uh, level of information to know um, what service was going to be required for the individual buildings. And so the size of those services is what drives then um, what, what type of, um, of uh, power needs to be brought to the site. Um, and so we acquired that information through electric service applications later in the engineering process. And that was when it became apparent that there was inadequate supply surrounding the site. Go ahead, Brian. Wouldn't the developer do their due diligence prior to buying the property to know all of that information, you know, with engineering? I would think, you know what I'm saying? Like, they know what they want to build. Wouldn't they contact the city and say, hey, this is, this is what we want to build. This is, because this seems like it's just coming, they're already tearing up the, the property and things like that. And it just seems very... Um, odd that they're coming back after the project's already started. Yes, I would, I would say it's, it's somewhat um, of a function of the fact that the city has our own municipal electric utility, um, that often the, you know, the level of information that they might be looking for um, at the front end is, is not as easy to obtain um, because the, it, the, the incentives or um, uh, arrangements that are available for industrial users who connect to a larger utility like ComEd um, there's more ability to build that into part of the rate structure for the property. Um, with a municipal electric utility, um, we're a zero standard utility, which means any user um, has to pay the full 100% cost to bring the service to the site. And sometimes that is not well understood until we're far along in the engineering process to, to really understand the extent to which um, the, the system upgrades might be required. And just to further elaborate a little bit on that, I know they've been working with Public Works closely for a while to determine if there was going to be sufficient capacity with our existing electrical loads to get them the power they needed. So those details have been just developed recently, essentially by the time that we decided to bring forth this recommendation to City Council because we weren't sure what type of work was going to need to be done, which is how this ended up being necessary. And, and then my follow-up question is this. Are, are they here, by the way? Yeah. Oh. So my question is, uh, would they be interested in sustainable site planning? In other words, including maybe uh, solar on the roof or something like that. Is that something they would consider um, with this TIF if it would move forward? Is that something the developer would take into consideration? I think that we would consider solar to the extent um, working with public works and we figure how it could get on the grid and how it could be used. The other problem that you have with industrial buildings is some future users might need the roof for uh, rooftop units, uh, various equipment that would go on the roof, and that might prohibit big, large areas for the solar panels. Um, so I guess. The answer is we would consider it, but it would be on a case-by-case -case basis and to see if it was uh, feasible. So, so that is something you would consider doing on putting solar on, like, on whatever buildings that you can. That's 
Yes, yeah, so, I mean we haven't we haven't contemplated that to date, but it was okay. it would be something we would look at. I mean, for me, just looking at the amount of money you're asking for and what it's for, I th- I think this is an opportune time to kind of look at something like that, maybe to start pulling that into the conversation with some developments. But I'm just curious if if <clears throat> Peter, I'm I'm not sure if 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 that is something that would benefit them on the load or something like that. Is there any benefit to, to doing that on some degree? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly solar is a benefit. Wind, wind is a benefit. But what I can probably tell you uh, now, and just thinking about this for the first time over the last minute or two, is that the load requirement that they need is still going to need to be the same load requirement from the electric utility right. because the sun doesn't shine all the time. Right. And so when they need load, they're going to need the same load that, uh, from, the, from the utility itself. So, yeah, there's benefits in solar, but that's not going to reduce the load on the utility itself. Okay, but there is a benefit to, to some degree of having that. Uh, yeah, that's, okay. that's, a, that's, a, that's a preference for their, uh, their group to figure out and, and determine okay. and apply for. That, that's something but I would it like will, to say. It will not reduce the no, I, that's load understood. that's necessary from the utility. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Go ahead, Heather. Thank you. The other item I wanted to point out, this is a significant development that's going to be coming to the city with a large square footage of property that would be difficult to develop otherwise because of its proximity to the airport. So this is going to generate from our expectations once the study is complete a significant amount of tax revenue and increment for us that will make it available to potentially incentivize some frontage on that property that we are having some difficulties with because of some complications with cell towers and other issues. So this is going to be a relatively short payback on a significant investment for the city. So I just want to make sure that everybody's keeping that in mind as we're having this discussion. I realize $11 million looks like a large dollar amount, but it is going to generate a significant amount immediately on that property. Thank Thank you. Go ahead, Brian. Without the without this financial incentive request, what happens? I think that's really up to the developer, um, but they have identified that this is a significant enough cost that they would not proceed with the project. Okay. Now, what what they would do with the property, I can't say. Sure. Go ahead, Ed. And what might be a short uh, time period of payback? I, I know that's probably coming down the road still, but are we talking like five or ten years? Or yes. Is it... Yes. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Last question. Last question. Um, the TIF area is the whole pheasant run property, correct? Correct. What happens if down the road we need money for demo or whatever? What happens then in this? So the district would be established over all of the properties. Um, and again, with this inducement resolution, this is the furthest extent. Um, that we are proposing the TIF district could right. extend. Once the district is actually created, it may be a, a smaller area potentially. But the, the concept is that once this TIF district is in place, the potential increment being generated by the properties within the district could be used for uh, improvements on any of the properties that are within the district. Okay. So, uh, yeah. um, does this, okay, this just obligates us to do the study, okay? What if it doesn't qualify? We don't know that for a fact, do we? We don't. Preliminarily, our TIF consultant has advised that it would qualify, okay, but the study that. needs to be completed to identify which parcels can be included and meet the eligibility. I'm curious, because I, you said it's going to be for the whole property, including the hotel park, correct? Correct. Because I'm curious to see if what parcels are included or not included before I actually will approve this. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Go ahead, Heather. Just, I'm sorry, one quick final point, um, and I think it's an important point to note about what the developer would do absent this TIF. Because we run our own electric utility, the cost for actually providing electric to sites is much different than a ComEd run property. They would subsidize the cost of running new electrical or increased electrical loads for these developments over several years. So the developer is not often required to fund it up front. We do not operate the same because of our electric utility. So we are asking the developers to do something that's not really typical in the development world. So that's part of the rationale behind why we're recommending this as well. Thank you. Go ahead, Paul. Um, would there be anything from stopping us if we found that we needed to TIF an adjacent area from creating a TIF as needed? So this would preclude other TIF work if it 
ended up being necessary later. Is that correct? Because I believe uh, Alderman Silkitis asked that question that until we considered what property was included that he wasn't going to be ready to, to vote. Yeah, I, well, I think the district that's being proposed um, is the area that is, was the former resort property. Sure. So these are all properties that have interrelated um, issues and constraints with redevelopment. Um, so it wouldn't preclude, um, you know, from an adjacent property being um, designated as a TIF district, but the intent here was really to capture all of what was the former resort because it inherently has similar issues. But uh, uh, actually, that answered my question perfectly well. I mean, it, so this is what makes sense, and it's you know, if, if something else needs to be done later for a different reason, you can do that then. Go ahead, Todd. Okay, so um, so an inducement resolution is simply the start of the process. Mm -hmm. It doesn't commit us to create a TIF district. It doesn't commit us to sign an RDA mm -hmm. that hasn't been negotiated yet. Um, and so the real question um, that I think this council should consider is what is the increment that's generated in terms of the repayment piece of this? And did I hear five years, five to ten years, something like that? Yeah, and it depends on, you know, the repayment schedule, which is a function of the redevelopment agreement, right. but starting from day one, it is within the five to 10 year range, okay. if it was 100%. And that's a fairly mm -hmm. expedited mm -hmm. TIF mm -hmm. as far as mm -hmm. my Absolutely. experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Yes. For this piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good deal. <clears throat> Everyone good up here? I just okay. have one more question. Go I'm ahead, just Brian. curious. The interest that's that's written down. Where where did that number come from? TIF interest. Can you explain that to me? Um, that was a calculation provided by the developer as part of the the incentive application. Um, so this is going to need to be further reviewed and refined as part of negotiating the redevelopment agreement. But that's kind of their their first um, proposal for what their ask is. Um, I can't say necessarily how that was calculated. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Um, with that being said, uh, looking for a, a motion and a second to possibly approve the inducement resolution for the Pheasant Run Fifth District. Move for approval. Second. Moved by Todd, seconded by Ryan. Um, can I please have a roll call on that? Silkaya? Yes. Bala? Yes. Leitner? Yes. Bongard? Yes. Bancroft? Yes. Lencioni? Yes. Trillo? Yes. Orbaugh? Yes. Esther? Yes. Motion carries. With that being said, now we move to item 4H, which is uh, would be the contract to begin um, looking at the TIF district. Go ahead, Russell. Yeah, so the staff is engaging our TIF consultant, Kane McKenna and Associates, um, to assist with establishment of the TIF district. Um, they've been authorized to initiate um, phase one of that process, which is the TIF analysis report. And this um, contract we're seeking approval for is for phase two, which would be preparing a TIF redevelopment plan and coordinating the TIF adoption process. Um, per the city's incentive application policy, developer uh, slash applicant is to provide the funds to cover the full cost of these um, professional services. And so we have those funds to cover phase one. Um, and subject to a, a council approval of the phase two contract, we will obtain <coughs> those funds um, to uh, complete the process. Um, and uh, that would not be initiated until those funds have been received. Comments on that? Seeing none, um, looking for a motion and a second to approve the contract. Move for approval. Moved by Todd, seconded by Brian. Roll call, please. Lacaya? Yes. Paula? Yes. Haylander? Yes. Bongard? Yes. Bancroft? Yes. Lencioni? Yes. Trilla? Yes. Herbal? Yes. Esther? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Moving on to item 4K, Alan Fennell making the presentation on the Title 15 of the City Code for Building Permit Fees. Thank you. Uh, building and Code Enforcement Division offsets its operating costs for building permits and inspection services through construction permit fees. Approximately every three to four years, staff reviews the fee structure in relation to the services the division provides to determine if adjustments are necessary. The last update took effect in January 2018 with increases phased, phased in through January 2020. Permit fees are based on administrative costs to process submittals, review plans, and conduct inspections for a particular type of project. This year, we also included a nominal amount for engineering review. In-house engineering reviews are now conducted by the development engineering staff for smaller permit projects 
in part to comply with the county stormwater ordinance. Uh, please note the Building and Code Enforcement Office provides a number of no-fee services to customers and applicants. For fiscal year 2021, permit fees covered approximately 72% of Building and Code Enforcement's budget. So fee increases are being proposed where there's a discrepancy between costs and fees. The fee schedule is more progressive based on the cost and complexity of the project. Some fee calculation formulas are changing to simplify the administrative functions. Certain permit types are kept at a low cost in order to encourage homeowners and contractors to apply for permits. This, is used, this is, uh, includes fences, windows, small appliance permits. Uh, and the fee increases would be effective May 1st of this year. Staff is not recommending a phase of implementation of fee increases. This is complicated from an administrative standpoint and results in fees continuing to lag behind costs. I'll take any questions you, you have. Questions? I, I think it looks good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It makes it more efficient. Mm -hmm. I, I think mm -hmm. it, it makes sense and that way you're not doing these, these steps every year and right. you time it up right. Mm -hmm. So right. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. you did a good job mm -hmm. um, going through this and making it uh, simpler. So with that being said, I'm looking for a motion and a second to, to approve. So move. Moved by Brian, seconded by Yes, Seconded by Ed. Uh, can I please have a roll call on that? So, Kaida? Yes. Paula? Yes. Paylander? Yes. Ongard? Yes. Bancroft? Yes. Sancioni? Yes. Trillo? Yes. Werbaum? Yes. Fester? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, last, we have item 4i. Russell will be presenting in regards to lot 4, the first street building number 8, redevelopment agreement. Yes, uh, the city owns the vacant grass lot that's at the northeast corner of Illinois Street and Route 31, and that lot's been planned for development of First Street Building 8. In 2019, there was a redevelopment agreement that was entered, um, and the terms of that agreement are to convey the property uh, at no cost. The developer would be responsible for constructing the building and extending uh, pedestrian streetscape improvements along Illinois Street. Now, the construction of the project was initially planned in 2020. Uh, there were construction plans prepared for building permit review. However, the project didn't proceed any further, um, and, the, the, and since that time, uh, some of the dates in the agreement have passed. So the city and developer have the right to terminate the RDA if they so choose, or alternately, the RDA permits the construction schedule to be extended by mutual agreement of the city and developer. So last time uh, the committee was updated on this project um, was one year ago. At that time, the developer indicated that the project was contingent on pre-leasing and there were delays arising, primarily due to the pandemic. Um, so no action was taken regarding the schedule, but staff was directed to uh, bring back the RDA before the committee for an update in one year. Um, and at this time, we have a, a letter from the developer, a, a statement indicating that they're attempting to finalize a letter of intent for restaurant use uh, and speaking to office users for the upper floors, but that the pre-leasing really um, needs to be in place before they will initiate the construction of the building. So um, given that this one year has passed, staff's looking for direction from the committee. Um, we're not aware of any other development interest in the site beyond this um, proposal and redevelopment agreement. Um, and uh, there has been an investment made by the developer in putting together plans. Um, so if the interest is in seeing the site develop, this is really the um, best opportunity for it to happen uh, in a, the near term. However, given the time that's elapsed, we think it would be appropriate to require the developer to submit um, an updated schedule. Um, and depending on how long that time frame is, we may decide then to amend the RDA to incorporate that schedule. Um, alternately, if the committee would like to consider other options for the property, um, we have the ability to consider termination of the RDA. Um, but given the, the size and configuration of this parcel, um, the development opportunities or other use opportunities are fairly limited. Um, since it's a pretty small site with limited access. So, Russell, walk, walk me through if, you know, everything, we go along with this and, and everything's fine, and what happens two months from now if, if a new person shows up and reaches out to the city and wants to do something about it? So if we leave the agreement in place as it is, we would have the ability then to review whatever that proposal is and make a decision as to whether we wanted to continue um, with this redevelopment agreement or not, because we passed the date um, after which we have the ability to terminate it. So if, if we say yes to this, we're not bound by anything. We're not stuck, right? 
No. The city land perspective okay. No. Because we've, we've passed those deadlines. So if the schedule, uh, if the developer provides a schedule that's, um, you know, a reasonable time frame um, where we're seeing construction over the next year or two, um, then I would suggest that we don't necessarily need to amend the redevelopment agreement. Because if we do, then we're committing to a new schedule um, for the developer to, to hit certain milestones uh, for completion. And that would sort of limit our options then if, if there was an alternate proposal that came yeah. forward. So, so for, today, for today's purposes, we just... Do nothing? Correct? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, I think that staff is looking for a recommendation that we say yes, let's ask the developer for a new schedule and then see where right. we land there. Right, right. Correct? Yes, yes. If the committee is supportive of that. Okay. Support that? Yep. Support that? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. Moving along, we now open it up to public comment. Someone has a comment, please step to the podium, state your name, address. Seeing none, alrighty. Um, any additional items from Mayor, City Council? I have nothing. Does anyone up here have anything? Mayor, anything? All right, I'm looking for a motion and a time to adjourn. So moved. So moved by Second. Brian, seconded by David. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those say nay. The ayes have it. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Let it go. Too much water.